Welcome to module four of coding for crosswords. If you want information on the entire course, see the links below. In the last module, we learned how to write a program to add one plus one and print the answer out. In this module, we're going to get a little closer to the goals of crossword puzzles by loading a sample grid. So we're going to, you could review module two and go back and look at the grid that we're going to use as in our, our example. And we're going to try to load that into a variable in our program. Okay, so get your editor ready. Get a window like this where you can type code and a window like this where you can execute, compile and execute code. Um, and if you need to review those, go back to modules um, two, module, the, the various modules two for Microsoft Windows, Linux, uh, Macintosh, or even just in a browser. There's ways to do it. All those ways there's probably a hundred ways to do that so let's get the file going here and i'm going to bring up the same file i had last time which just um, prints out some simple numbers and we're going to change that and the first thing we're going to do is the concept of a variable so just like in math class all computer languages allow you to declare a variable like x equals one okay let's get rid of the c out for a second Actually, we can we can print we can print that. See how let's print x. Remember, we have the semicolons at the end. It will it will die if we don't have those. So let's see what this does. And here we go. We're going to type in again g plus plus a dot c is the input. The output's going to be called a file called a. And that command may vary based on what your compiler environment looks like. But here we go. Now it's going to say error. X was not declared. So C++, unlike other languages, um, requires you to define the type of everything. So what I just wrote would actually work in Python. Python says X, ah, I'll let X be anything. But C++ says you need X to be an integer, a floating point number, a string, uh, a data object, what is it? And so we need to say in our example, let's say int. So X allows an integer value to be represented so we can store something to it and we can access it later so if you print that out what do you think is going to happen one ha do you see how we forgot our line feed if you remember from last time we need a little line feed here that will give it uh make it look a little better okay now you might be saying what would happen if i put in something like 1.9 in there we've said it's an integer right we said X can only hold integer values, just like in math class. An integer value is like 0, 1, 2, minus 3. 1.9 is not an integer value, so what does it do? Well, there's a lot of rules about how it can take things and convert them. And a floating point number can be converted automatically to an integer. And what would it convert it to? You might think it might round it, um, but it doesn't. It actually just truncates it. So let's see what this does, but I'm... Guessing it will just write one. Okay. You can come awfully close. What do you think that will do? You think that's close enough to two? Nope, it's not. Some languages are funny, actually. You can actually do this, and it will actually round it to two. <laughs> but that's nothing that you need to be too worried about. That's like numerical stability. Yes, so we did it there. So that's, there's a whole topic about uh, numerical stability for floating point algorithms that we don't need to get into now, but it's kind of interesting. The basic idea is that X is an integer. Let's add some more text to this. So hello, I All right, what did I write there? Anything in string, so this whole thing here, see that whole thing there is one thing, even though it has spaces in it, the quotation marks say that's one string. So that's gonna get printed. And then the next thing is gonna get printed, which is the value X, which is here. And then it's gonna say a hamburger, right? So if you run this, what's it gonna do? So hello, I want a hamburger. So this is the old elementary school joke, right? Hello, I ate a hamburger. Now, what if we wanted to put this thing into a variable? What do we do? 
Let's try it. Let's do int y equals hello. And again, we have to terminate it. Remember, these semicolons have to be at the end of everything. Um, it could be a little annoying, but then you kind of get used to it. Let's try that. What do you think that's going to do? Now, remember I said that some variable types can convert automatically, like a floating point number will round to an integer. A string, it doesn't really know how to do it. So the compiler actually just stops and says, I can't do it. I don't know how to take hello and reasonably make an integer out of it. So you need to actually call that a string. There's just no way around that. Um, so when you do that, it compiles just fine. And what we can do now is instead of saying hello here, we can replace this part with, whoops, not string, with y. Okay, so now do you see what's gonna happen? What do you guess? Hello gets printed here, so it should be the same result as before. It's just we're doing it with variables now instead. So it is hello, I ate a hamburger. Now, um, there's one detail I should have mentioned that we kind of got for free, but we really should have said includes string. String is one of those things that doesn't actually come for free in the language. You have to add it. So we got away with it probably because IO stream probably also included um, string, but it's reasonable coding practice to put that in there. You don't really need to for recreational code. So now we want to talk a little more about string because it's a very powerful class, this, this string here. And it comes from something called STL, Standard Template Library String. And again, to find out what string does, what, we can, what things we can do with this, we need to go to the web and look it up. So let's do that. So the easiest way is to just type it in like you think. You're gonna say, um, you can just even say string in C++. That's really all you need. And there's a website called c++.com, which is quite good. And there's a number of other ones too, but this one is a good one. And it's gonna be a reference on the string class. So these are all from a library called STL, Standard Template Library. These are called templates, these things we're including. It doesn't really matter. The main idea is that you can use the string and here's all the things you can do with it. And I wanna spend some time going through these because they're very important for a couple of reasons. One is that you wanna do things with strings, you need to know them, but also it sets the pattern in your mind of how you're gonna use other objects from this STL library, the standard template library, which is really uh, invaluable. You have to use that library for just so many things. You don't have to, but, uh, but you really uh, benefit from using that library. And in practice, everybody uses it. So it's really part of the core language, even though it is included, sort of, it looks like an extra add-on. Most people consider it just part of the language. Let's look at a few easy ones first. Okay, let's look at the capacity. So there's a function called size. So how you access that function that's part of that string is that you go like this. Let's change this back up to uh, something simpler. Let's print out the size. That's what you say. You say y, and then the dot means the size is part of y. So you're asking y, what is its size? And this is not gonna be correct but it'll show you what the idea is. So let's see what this does. Challenge right here, try this on your own and try to guess what this might do with a compiler or with a runtime. So here we go. And it gives you an error message. And a lot of times the error messages from the STL library are unfortunately a pain to figure out. They're difficult to figure out. So I apologize for that. If we look at the error message, it says invalid use of non-static member function. So size is, a, is, a, is what I call a member function. It's not a function like main that's hanging out on its own. It's a function that's part of a data object. You're asking the size of y, and it should be five. Five characters are inside y. But the basic key here that you should pick out is where the error is happening, and it's right here. It's in line, it's in line nine character eight, if that matters. So it's right here, it's the, it's the y dot size. It doesn't like this. And there's a reason why, but you may not know it. A, 
let's go back to the browser, okay? So if you go back to the browser and you look at the what the C++ reference site says, it says, here, here we go. Here's the string and here's the size function. And it says, oh, it's a function. And that's a clue here is look at what's on this function. It's the parentheses. When you want to call a function, you have to give it the inputs. Just like we had on the main, we had the inputs. So, and if you look at their example, it's very close to ours, by the way. Um, you're going to be printing string dot size. And then look, they use these parentheses to indicate that they're calling a function. So let's go back to this window now, the source window. As you've written it here, as I've written it here, it's just the name of the function. But we don't just want that. We don't want the function name. We actually want to call it. And, we, and there's no arguments to give it. It's like we're giving it nothing inside. So we just call it. So that will will say, what for the variable called y, which is a string, what is the size? And let's see what that does. And that answer is indeed five. So the size returns how many characters are inside that string. Let's go back to the browser and look at a few more functions that are available uh, in the string. Here's one called clear. So we can call the function clear. Now again, that's just the name of the function, but if we call it, it would put the parentheses. Now, what do you think is gonna happen? This is a challenge. What do you think is going to print when we compile this? Give it a try and see for yourself. But here I go, I'll do it and I'll show you, zero. So it cleared y. We can also also print y itself. Size is y. So you see what I did there? So we're printing y first, then we're printing the size is. That's just a string constant. So it's going to actually print size is. Then it's going to print the number, and that's going to print a line feed. So if we run that, we get size is zero. But if we don't put this clear in here, we get it prints size is five, it also prints what the thing is right there. So you've seen how to define a string and then how to use it a little bit. Why do we care? We care because we want to solve this problem. Let's go back and look at the problem from module one. You can go back and review that if you want to be reminded of the problem we're trying to solve in the crossword, but it's this grid. We want to load this grid into our program and we're going to do that with strings. So we're going to encode it like this. Let's go back to the source window and we'll show what we want to do. Instead of this hello string, we're gonna start with something, let's call it S and let's put, that we're going to encode it. We're gonna put in the letters that are in that picture and we're gonna just type in the dog like it is. And then we're gonna put in a dot for the blocks. The block is the crossword term for those black squares. So what we're gonna do, maybe we'll call this S0, the first one, then we'll, then we'll call the next one S1, and we'll do this all the way to how many lines are in the puzzle, which should be seven. So there's seven lines in the puzzle, and we're showing that here with seven strings. And we're going to show in the string, we're gonna model what's in that puzzle. So it looks like this. Let's see if you can understand what we're doing. So we don't want two dogs, we want to have this be a cat. So let's, let's note a couple things. Number one, this crossword puzzle is symmetric. It's seven by seven, which is not an official size, but that's fine for just an example. And it's a square. It's seven characters wide and it's seven rows deep or high. And it's also symmetric in that there's a seed phrase up here, dog, and there's also a seed phrase down here, cat. It has some blanks, so horizontally, there's a three-letter blank, a four-letter blank, a seven-letter blank, um, another four, another three, and then vertically, there are also these blanks here. This is, this is a four-letter blank, right? It goes D blank, 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 and then O blank, 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 and then another four-letter for G, and then there's a three-letter vertical here, and then a four, and a four, and a four, ending with C, A, and T. So this is the start of representing that information in the program. And you'll see how once we do this, we can then uh, 
add operations that will manipulate this data and do useful things like filling in these uh, these values. You know, we want the program eventually to fill in this to something like you know an R and an A and a W. So this is the word draw, and then have it find a word here. But for now, we're going to leave those as blanks. So this is your challenge. What will happen when we compile this? Is this going to work? And let's find out here. Let's go back to the execution window and let's try it. And it doesn't like this dog. So do you see what we've forgotten to do? This is a string. All of the strings have to be enclosed in these quotes like this. Okay, so once we do that, then we can get it to compile. Oh, and I forgot one more thing, ha, which is common, it's, which is the ending semicolon. So this program won't do anything yet because we don't have any print statements. The last part of this module, we're gonna go back now and some homework for you. So this is a challenge. There, go back to the web page for string, so the C++ string information page, and you will find a number of functions there. And I'm gonna give you an assignment. You must pick one of these to use in your own code. So empty, the function called empty, or you can pick the function called append, or you can pick an operator called plus equals, or you can pick find, or you can pick a thing called an operator bracket bracket. So go to the string page and pick one of those. You can look at the example and try to get one of them to work with some code and print out something interesting. Okay, you're back. I hope you had some success. Let's walk through each of these functions, these member functions of the string class and see how they work. So let's go back to the browser window and you remember that we got to the C++ reference guide by typing in string in C++ or anything close to that and then get into the string class and you'll be on this page or a page similar to it. And let's look down and let's see where those functions are listed. So empty is right here. It's part of the this, these queries called capacity. So let's click into empty and see what it says. String empty, it's a public member function and the idea of it is to test if a string is empty. So it returns a one if the string is empty or a zero if the string is not empty. So let's try that. So for now, let's comment these other ones out in the code window and let's do a C out. Let's say empty of S zero is, and then we're gonna call it. So we just, so we call a function on a variable like this. So S zero is the variable. It's a variable of type string. String happens to have all these functions you can call. Empty is one of them and let's run this. And like often I forget the line feed. So let's go see what that does in the execution window. And it can say empty of S0 is zero. That's because we've assigned something to it. So it's not empty anymore. Let's just do something just to show you how it would be empty. If you type in S0, compile that, now it's empty. So that's the function empty. It's very simple. It just returns a one or a zero or um, actually strictly speaking, let's go back to the browser window here. It returns this thing called bool. Bool is a Boolean. Um, it's either true or false. Um, but remember how some types can be converted to other types naturally without any extra work. And bool can be converted to an int um, without any extra work when it prints. So you'll print a bool as zero or one. Um, it's kind of curious, they could have done that as true or false um, with the handling of the standard output, but it prints as a zero or one, which is the same idea. Okay, so that's empty. Let's go back to the browser and look at the next one. The next one is append. Now append is a little more interesting. We're gonna be modifying the string. It's under modifiers here, and let's click into append. Let's look at the example. Now, there's a bunch of different examples here. This is called overloading. Depending on what you call append with, it will call one of these different functions in the list. So it'll just figure that out based on what you're calling it with. So let's just take the first one. String append, and it takes another string. 
Um, you can ignore some of this other stuff for a moment. We'll get to that in another few modules. Um, so let's go back to the coding window and try that. So we're doing append now. Um, let's comment out this empty stuff. So C out, let's say um, S0 is now something else. And let's do, because we're going to do S0 append, let's append extra to it. Okay. So this, you can probably guess what this is going to do. Let's go into our execute window and check it. And there it is. So now when it prints S0, it's printing the original S0 we had, and it just adds this extra code, uh, this extra text to it. Okay, let's do the next one. The next one is this operator called plus equals. So let's go back and find that one. And that is also in a modifier, and it's right next to append. Now, in fact, it actually does the same thing as an append. It's just a different syntax. So string operator plus equals, and it takes another string. It looks just like what we did. Let's go to the code window, and I'll show you how that works. So instead of the append, which we'll comment out there, we will do the plus equals. We will say s0 plus equals more stuff, okay? So let's go to the execute window and see what that does. And you can see it added the more to it. Okay, two more to go. Let's do the find. So back to the browser window and let's look for where find is. Now find is down here in a section called string operations. Um, and that means those are kind of more sophisticated queries on the string. You're not just asking it if it's empty or not. You're asking something about the string. And in this case, the find will try to find another string inside that string. So here's the first one. There's the different forms here. But the first one is going to try to find a string. And this second thing shows you a new concept called an, a default argument. This equals zero means that if you don't give it this pause, this POS, it will put zero in there. So I'll show you how that works in the code window here. So let's comment out that one. We're done with that one. Now we're doing find. We're going to say find. First of all, it's S0 find. And now we're going to say what we want to find. Let's try to find maybe a G. And we're going to just end it right like that. Now we want to also print this, so we're going to say the G in S0 is at position. Okay, so that's what we're going to show. So do you understand this? It's This is just a, a print. This whole thing here is just a literal, so it just prints that just like we said it. Um, the next thing it prints is going to be S0's function called find, where we give it G as the argument. So it's going to return the position of the G in the string, and then we do the new line. Okay, so what we expect that to return is a number that shows where the G is in that string. So let's go to the execute window, and we'll see that. And here it is. So the G is in position 2. So one, two, three, aha, but remember, we're computers, so we're always starting from zero. So zero, one, two. So G's in position two. Okay, only one more to go, and that is the bracket operator. Let's go back to the web page, and we'll find that one. That is going to be under element access, operator square bracket. So it's not the curly bracket, it's not the brace, it's the, it's the square bracket. So let's look at that. What this is going to do is going to return one character in the string. Well, we know character two is a G. Let's try to print that character. So what we're going to do now is we're going to say S0, oops, S, no, S0, and then we're going to say position two. So C out, let's get rid of this one, C out, um, character at position two is, okay, like this. Um, 
Does that make sense? It's the same kind of thing where we're printing. This is a string literal, and then we're printing S0. Um, and now in this case, we don't use the dot, the brackets an actual operator directly on S0. We don't have to say the dot. Um, and let's see what that does. That's gonna say the character of position two is a G. We can try printing the character of position three. And that will be a dot, which we've told it. Okay, so that's all for this module. We've learned how to define a string variable. We've learned how to assign something to it. We've learned how to check if it's empty. We've learned how to print parts of that string. We learned how to search that string for other strings or characters within that string. Um, and in the next module, we will learn how to work with these strings more efficiently. Right now, we've got these seven different variables called S0 through S6, and it's kind of hard to work with those. We want a more efficient way to work with those as a group. So that will be the topic of the next module.